good evening, everybody. Um, we're just getting started. The, the room is starting to populate. So I'm gonna give a, about a minute or so, just to let everybody roll in and then we'll get going. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, this is a really special night. This is the final workshop in the Solutions for a Changing Demara series um, that we started back in January. So for all of you that have tuned in each workshop, we really appreciate your continued support. Um, and we're really excited for this workshop that we have planned tonight, just to cap things off. Tonight's workshop is called Rescuing Demarva and the Planet. And we will use this as an opportunity to focus on equity and our climate adaptation efforts, and also give you another really engaging perspective on efforts to protect 50% of our planet. So this is our agenda for tonight. Um, we do have a, a longer evening plan, um, but as you'll see at the end of the night, we have a group Q&A on which we'll invite speakers from the previous workshops to come back so you can ask any of those burning questions that have been left over. Um, you know, hopefully they can give you some great perspective on that. Um, and just some quick housekeeping things. As always, as, as we've done with this entire series, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature. My colleagues and I will be monitoring that throughout each presentation just to make sure that each question gets posed back to the presenter um, in a time allotted for the Q&A. Jim, I left pass it to you. Thanks, Darius. Um, I want to give a special thanks to everybody who's joining us this evening. Uh, we we went sort of went back to the drawing board um, after the first couple of workshops that we did uh, because we realized there were so many questions and there were so many uh, there, there was such a strong desire from our attendees to have more direct participation uh, with the the presenters that we've had join us. Uh, which is a really, really good problem to have uh, from our perspective as, as the event organizers. Uh, so I'm so happy that everybody has turned out here tonight to continue some of this discussion. Um, I hope that you enjoy the, the additional opportunity that we've built in uh, for engagement with some of the speakers and some of the folks who have started to develop a relationship with us. Um, as always, we want to give a, a special shout out to the Rash Foundation. Um, for their generous support for the entire workshop series would not be possible without them. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, Kathy Brill, Phil Roush, and everybody else at the Roush Foundation. Um, yeah, I just want to close it out by saying I really, really appreciate everybody's involvement tonight. Uh, this is the final event in our series. I've had so much fun with it. I hope that you guys have had so much fun with it as well. Um, let's, uh, let's get on with it. Thanks, Darius. Thanks for that, Jim. All right, so we have some great featured speakers ready for you all tonight. Um, we're going to hear from Tony Hiss, a renowned author, lecturer, and scholar, and really just a great friend of myself and of Eastern Sri Lankan Conservancy. We're really glad to have him here tonight. We're also going to have Liz Williams Russell, the Climate Justice Program Director for the Foundation from Louisiana. There's always something to be learned about Coastal Louisiana and just what they're doing with climate change and climate adaptation. So we're really happy to have her here and just to see what we can learn and apply here on the Delmarva Peninsula. Um, Tony, do you mind turning your camera on while I introduce you? Wait a second. All right. So Tony is the author of 15 books, including the award-winning The Experience of Place, he was a staff writer at the New Yorker for more than 30 years. He was a visiting scholar at the New York University for 25 years, and he has lectured around the world. He lives in New York with his wife, young adult writer, Lois Metzger. Tony, we're really glad to have you here tonight. Um, I know you have your presentation ready, so on that note, you can unmute yourself and start sharing. It's all yours. Well, thank you, Darius. Um... Can you see the pictures? Uh, 
Yeah, we can. Good. I'm delighted to be part of this final workshop in the Eastern Shore Land Conservancy's Great Solutions for a Changing Delmarva series. It's an exciting day for me personally because it's publication day for my new book, Rescuing the Planet, which has a lot to say about the future of Delmarva and celebrates the peninsula as one of the key places in this country. The book is about protecting half of all land and water to stave off a mass extinctions crisis, half earth to keep life alive, an idea that has already found a wonderful home here on the Delmarva Peninsula. I know you earlier in the series, you had an outstanding presentation from Paula Ehrlich from the Half Earth Foundation. So anything I can say will probably be redundant to that. Um, let's see. Moving a little slowly. Sorry about that. Beyond climate change, the world faces a grave calamity. One million species are at imminent risk of extinction and some are already gone. This is Sudan, the last male Northern white rhino who died in Kenya in 2018. We've already come up with a word we shouldn't have, shouldn't have to need, endling. An endling is the last of its kind. This is Lonesome George, the last known Pinta Island tortoise in the Galapagos Islands who died in 2012 at the age of 101. What's happening now is a contradiction to what's been happening gradually over the last half billion years. Despite five mass extinctions marked by yellow triangles on this slide, the general trend has been up even after the cataclysm that killed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, um, up and up in terms of more and more life and more and more species. But now we face an extinction rate that's 100 to 1,000 times higher than anything that's been experienced. Well, we know that North America is a very different place than it was 350 years ago. When a missionary and a philosophy student, Jacques Marquette and Louis Joliet, explored the Mississippi River as far south as Arkansas. They were welcomed by each Native American settlement. They passed and they couldn't go 15 minutes without seeing an abundance of wildlife. One day they caught a catfish so big, they thought that it had a head of a tiger. We know that one of the reasons we got into trouble was because we then displaced the Native Americans. Those in the Southeast were forced to resettle west of the Mississippi along the Trail of Tears. Hundreds, tens of thousands of them, many died en route. For the longest time, we thought we were doing exactly the right thing. Here's an 1872 painting called American Progress. Progress, that's the golden haired lady with not very many clothes on, who's trailing telegraph uh, wires behind her as she moves west across the continent, accompanied by a covered wagon, a stagecoach, and railroads. And farms follow her, and people and animals are displaced, a bear snarls, Behind her, the sky is getting lighter and lighter as civilization approaches. Fortunately, some people began thinking differently well over a century ago. And that's the hopeful news. Some people have found it possible to look beyond loss to see the great landscapes that contain and sustain so much of life. In the summer of 1900, a young New England forester celebrated having graduated college by bushwhacking up Stratton Mountain in Vermont and shinnying up the tallest tree he could find to look around, where he was overcome by what he later called a planetary feeling. In his mind, he could see the whole range of the Appalachian Mountains as a single place, a realm, he called it. 
one that needed protection and could be celebrated and accessed by a footpath along the ridge tops, the Appalachian Trail, which then came into being 2,190 miles long across 14 states and entirely constructed and maintained by volunteers inspired by the vision created by Benton Mackay, that young forester. The Appalachian realm is an extraordinary landscape and only now are the guardians of the trail beginning to extend into the realm their, uh, what they have taken on as, a, as the next task for them. For a long time, they were single-minded about getting the trail done, but now they realized that Mackay was calling them to do two things, construct the trail and protect the realm. The realm itself has been a place for migration of animals north and south over the last 100,000 years or more. When you look at a map of North America, the Appalachian realm is only in the east is only the smallest of four huge landscapes. It's parallel to the west by the Rockies. And then there are the boreal forest to the north in Canada and Alaska, a truly immense place, and the coastal plain on the south coast. It's a good thing people started thinking big when they did, because 35 years ago, it was already evident that the conventional ways of thinking about conservation just weren't working. We couldn't just designate some special places and figure we'd done enough. Because if these special places got isolated from the larger landscapes around them, they could no longer provide for the animals they were supposed to protect. The question I'm most often asked is, but why 50%? There are several answers. One is evidence. A raft of studies has shown that many animals must retain at least 50% of their natural surroundings to thrive. To be precise, there's a range of needs. Some species seem to need 25%, some 75% and 50 is a way of striking a nice balance. Another reason is math pioneered by E.O. Wilson, the great champion of biodiversity, without whom none of this would be happening. We can predict, Wilson showed, what will happen if animals and plants lose more space. So far, we've protected about 15% of this continent, and it took us 150 years after setting up Yellowstone National Park, the very first national park in the world, a wonderful American invention to get this far. But if we bump up that figure to 50% protected land, then 85 to 90% of plants and animals can survive. Not everything, but close to it. Bee ag, another reason. Even 10 years ago when I started working on this book, 50% still seemed like an awful lot to ask for, wildly ambitious, preposterous, but it could be set up as what's called a bee hag, a big, hairy, audacious goal, like putting men on the moon in a decade. Only this time, it's protecting 50% of land by 2050, 50 by 50. And it's funny how things change. Only this year, the Biden administration embraced the idea of 30 by 30, protecting 30% 30 of the US by 2030 as a first step towards 50 by 50. And suddenly 50 by 50 is beginning to sound almost commonplace. The final reason is that we use less than 50% of the land. So 50 by 50 is a goal that can be reached without displacing anyone or what people need to do. A word about this fierce looking Russian scientist, Vladimir, Ivanovich Vernadsky. So famous in Russia, they've named a Moscow subway station after him and a crater on the dark side of the moon. His 1926 book, Biosfera, the first definitive study 
of the layer of life that contains everything alive introduced us to the most sobering aspect of the biosphere. Yes, it's ancient, maybe 3.8 billion years old or even older. And yes, it's immense from side to side, but then there's its height. It's shockingly thin, up and down. Almost all of life can be found in the 12 and a half miles between the bottom of the ocean and the top of Mount Everest. In other words, if this was a horizontal distance, you could drive from one end of life to the other in less than 20 minutes. We keep finding amazing new things, components of the biosphere, like this spider whose scientific name is Aerovixia griffindori, because it looks like the sorting hat in Harry Potter, or this African vulture, which can fly so high, it once collided with a jetliner, or these amazing giant lake trout up in Great Bear Lake in the boreal forest, fish that look, it look like something in a fantasy, but are very real and can live to be 60 or 70 years old. And that's leaving out the world wide web as our understanding about plants increases at an extraordinary rate. And we now can see that trees in a forest act almost like a super organism, aware of each other, exchanging nutrients, warning of insect attacks, and connected to each other by, at the roots by miles and miles and miles of fungal fibers. So back to the half earth blackboard. Within these circumstances, within this amazingly immense and at the same time thin and precarious place that is the home to every species, there are three principles to follow. Retain what's still wild, restore what once was wilder, reconnect the pieces that have been severed. As for instance, in the boreal forest, North America's least known asset, a breathtaking place, the world's vastest and most intact wilderness. 3,700 miles long, as big as three quarters of the lower 48 US states altogether, and less cut over than either Siberia or the Amazon. It must be retained. It has two nicknames, North America's bird nursery, because every year, Billions of songbirds and shorebirds fly up there to raise the next generation. And the Fort Knox of carbon, because its trees and soil and peat hold billions of tons of carbon that if released by nonstop timbering would greatly accelerate global warming, amounting to something like 37 years worth of fossil fuel emissions. But the boreal itself to be retained also needs to reconnect. In this case, to the people who've been living there for the 10,000 years. The people who have intimate knowledge of the land and what its plants and animals need. And that's exactly what the Canadians are now doing. Although their record with treating Native Americans had its dismal side, they're now celebrating the people and they never displaced them. And they're now setting up a whole new series of national parks called indigenous protected areas where the rangers will be the people who live there, rangers from within, as they're calling them, mucklocks on the ground instead of boots on the ground. Here's one of the first indigenous protected areas, the ADJ, and it coincides with the other, the third of the great landscapes of North America the fact that one Canadian activist and lawyer named Harvey Locke discovered years ago that you could say that the landscape from Yellowstone Park north all the way to the Yukon was a single landscape, Y to Y as he called it, a conservation initiative that's made extraordinary progress in the last 25 years. We've also been learning a lot from the animals themselves as we get better 
at following what they're up to. In 1992, a wolf named Pluie, so-called because she was captured in pouring rainstorm in Canada, was given one of the first collars that could be connected to a satellite. For a while they thought, well, she'll wander around a bit. Then they thought, wait a moment, we, we're not hearing from her anymore. And it was months later that a NASA satellite picked up, picked up a signal from Pluie miles and miles away in the South. Uh, and over the next 18 months, she covered a territory 10 times the size of Yellowstone National Park, covering parts of three US states and two Canadian provinces. Here was a sudden revelation that the actual uh, living quarters of a wolf were far greater than anything we had suspected. We had to adjust our thinking. Now, we, the tags we put on animals can be much smaller than they ever were before. Um, and here's Martin Wachelski, an amazing German scientist who has taken the idea to its ultimate, which is he set up antennas on the International Space Station, which will be able to monitor um, hundreds of thousands of animals simultaneously and track their whereabouts across the globe, what he's calling the animal internet, just about to get launched. Back to the boreal for a moment. Retain and reconnect are also connected in the boreal because the Banff National Park is transected by the Trans-Canada Highway, an intercontinental highway, so busy that in summertime, a car goes past every three seconds, devastating uh, death trap for large animals. U.S. highways, on U.S. highways, one to two million large animals get killed every year. No longer the case in Banff, though, because for 25 years they've been building a system of 43 overpasses and underpasses that are there only for animals. And as a result, 200,000 safe crossings have been made by grizzly, mountain lion, elk, and wolves. It's time, they say, to make roadkill an obsolete word. In that fourth landscape along the south coast, there's a variety of habitats. At the bottom, there's a picture of the amazing um, longleaf pine forest, which was once the mainstay of that whole region of the country, but was leveled almost entirely after the Civil War. Uh, as a new way of making money. It's probably the reason Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind said she would never go hungry again. Then there's in Florida, a, a, an imaginative plan put forward decades ago by Reed Noss, a great conservation biologist of how to connect up the wild landscapes that exist. The longleaf pine is being rescued up in the Northwest of Florida but in a project that was started by a wonderful guy named M.C. Davis, who a self-made a self-made man who began his career raising a stake by playing poker, and later was able to buy 50,000 acres of played-out potato uh, peanut farms, where he began replanting longleaf pine, half a million seedlings a year. When I saw him a few years back, he said, well, we're in year 13 of a 300 year project. MC unfortunately is gone from us now, but he endowed the project so it will continue for another 275 years and bring the longleaf pine, pine forest back. Up in the top right, what we see is the first national reserve that was set up in the 1970s. It's the so-called pine lands in Southern New Jersey a million acres of, of pine lands. You can go to the top of the tallest hill and look out and see nothing but trees as far as your eyes will take you. This is a landscape in New Jersey, which is the most densely settled state 
in the country that has fewer people in it than there were there than were there at the time of the American Revolution. Speaking of the Pinelands brings me to an idea that began to try to come back in this country in the 1970s. It's the so-called Green Line Park idea. The Adirondack Park up in the north of New York State, six million acres, is the original Green Line Park, another great American invention. It was originally called a blue line park because a map of it showed with, circled by a blue line. This is 6 million wild acres, but only half of it is in public ownership. The rest is in private ownership. And yet its specialness is retained. After World War II, the English decided to try this idea and their whole national park system is based on the green line park idea. Extraordinary landscapes like the Lake District, the landscape that inspired William Wordsworth. And now 30% of Great Britain is in Green Line Park standing. Well, this was going to be the great rollout of the 1970s and 80s. It was going to be a whole new national park system that would supplement our conventional national park system. But this time it would be Green Line Parks the only flaw in the ointment was that this was going to be the great initiative and legacy of the second Jimmy Carter administration. But Jimmy Carter only lasted one term and was defeated in 1980 by Ronald Reagan. Now on Delmarva, the whole idea is being resurrected. And the Eastern Shore Land Conservancy in partnership with local, state, county, and federal wildlife officials is proclaiming the goal of protecting half of the Delmarva Peninsula by 2030 and creating this time, not from the top down, but from the bottom up, an outstanding area. In England, the national, there is the national park system and adjacent to it is what they call areas of outstanding natural beauty. Even they admit that's a clunky term. So I propose that perhaps it could be uh, shortened to outstanding areas or oases or OA or oases for short. Actually, my wife came up with that brilliant idea. And the first of these oases is going to be in Delmarva. Uh, what a wonderful opportunity and what a wonderful prototype for the rest of the country. It will take its place in the North American coastal plain. It has so many assets. It's one of the few places where the skies on the East Coast where the skies still get dark at night. It's one of the few places that still has so much natural land as well as farmland that dates back to the 18th and 17th centuries. It's a place where beautiful roads could become, Route 301, for instance, could become the equivalent the lowland equivalent of the, uh, of the parkways up in the, in, in the Appalachians, uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway, a, a lowland uh, Delmarva Parkway, an Eastern Shoreway, if you like. It's a place where because of uh, limited access, it's always been at least 15 minutes too far away from being overrun by suburbs. Uh, so it's a place where quiet still retains. The English and the Europeans have made a specialty in recent years of mapping tranquility or quiet places. This is another technique we could begin to explore in the Delmarva Oasis. Meanwhile, there are innovations everywhere. Um, on the left, Terrible problem in many big cities, including New York, of birds flying into glass windows and plate glass walls, thinking there, uh, there's nothing there but slamming into the glass. Um, but now many of these buildings are being retrofitted with bird-friendly glass, so-called fritted glass, that gives the birds a chance to shear off before impact. On the right is a green wall with the realization that planning doesn't have to be horizontal, it can be vertical. And this is a, actually 
a garage in England with a green wall. The only um, place where the debarrying de has come to a halt is down on the Mexican border. Trump's 18 to 30 foot wall, which threatens, threatens the future of 1500 plants and animals. A place, a construction the National Wildlife Federation calls an ecological disaster. It must be removed, um, Mr. President, tear down this wall. There are lots of ways of getting um, attuned to the biosphere and its needs. Um, for birders, there's something they call the spark bird. This is in some ways an answer to an endling. The spark bird is that bird that first caught their attention and mesmerized them and thereafter became an inescapable and ill decidable part of their lives something they uh, carry with them for the rest of their days, uh, a feeling of connection to the natural world. But, you know, it doesn't have to be a bird that sparks that interest. It could be a spectacular view, a favorite view. It could be seeing a wildflower burst into bloom in the springtime, or it could be, as it was in Benton's Mackay, Benton Mackay's case, swinging from a treetop and the thoughts that then followed into his head. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share these pictures with you, uh, taken from my book. I hope you'll be interested to buy and read the book, um, try to cram a lot of stuff into it. Um, and a social distancing special can't, can't actually in these days um, have a signing uh, of a book, but what I can do is sign these book plates and send them along. And even if you let me know, uh, personally inscribe them to everyone. So Darius, thank you for letting me show these pictures. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing all that great perspective, Tony. We're all, we always appreciate it. And um, we do have some time for Q and A. So, um, if you don't mind hanging with this for a little bit, I'd definitely like to ask you some I would questions. Be delighted. I wish I could stay for the whole program, but unfortunately I have to teleport myself to a bookshop in Massachusetts. <laughs> Man of many talents. <laughs> I'm telling you, I won't keep it too long. So um, this is to start off, you know, I want to ask, why did you decide to write about Hat Earth? And um, you know, what prompted you and, and what was your writing process? Well, it's a subject that sort of snuck up on me. Um, early on, I began getting interested in the fact that uh, so many plants and animals were in a precarious state. And of course, there was at that time much more attention being paid to climate change uh, without the realization that's been growing so rapidly uh, recently that these are really two aspects of the same problem. Uh, I was lucky enough early on to, to make the acquaintance of the great E.O. Wilson, uh, Edward O. Wilson, and he encouraged me to keep going and began introducing me around the country to people who were making extraordinary progress in staving off the mass extinctions uh, crisis. M.C. Davis, the wonderful fellow down in Florida, was a close friend of Ed's, um, and he also knew the people out in Montana who were working on Ted Turner's property out there uh, where he's raising bison, but has welcomed wolves back into the landscape. He doesn't see a contradiction. Uh, and that was what got me started on finding out that so many people are doing so many extraordinary things uh, and having such great success um, that this is really a very hopeful story. Uh, as Paula Ehrlich was outlining to you in an earlier workshop. It's nice to feel like uh, something positive is happening. Yes, there's a tremendous amount of work to be done to get from 15% protected to 50% protected. 
in only 30 years. It's still a daunting task, but so many people are engaged on it. And, and so many people in many different areas probably aren't aware yet of thinking of themselves as all doing the same thing. Uh, but they are, and, uh, and there's a great impetus behind it, many heroes, and I've found a, a wonderfully positive spirit. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does, it does. We have another one for you. Um, what role do you see cities in addressing climate change and protecting or enhancing natural areas? I'm sorry, say that again? What role do you see for cities in addressing climate change and protecting or enhancing natural areas? Cities, did you say? What's that? Did you say cities? Yeah, cities. Well, actually cities are very much a part of this and that, I'm glad you asked that um, because it turns out that something like 70% of the parkland in the 50 largest cities in this country is still in natural condition of some kind, forests or wetlands, and uh, they're all making common cause. Enough acreage, if it was put together, would be three quarters the size of Yellowstone National Park. Also, we're beginning to see that we've done our best to uh, cover up ecosystems in cities, but the ecosystems uh, aren't taking that lightly. Even outside my apartment, and I live in a pretty big city, Manhattan and New York and Greenwich Village, even outside our apartment on the sidewalk, in the cracks, there are little tiny plants that keep growing back and back. Um, so it's a place where so many things could be done simultaneously to protect the wildlands that are left, to uh, begin to introduce more greenery through green walls and green roofs. There's now a, an or, a new ordinance in New York that new construction will have to have green roofs, meaning planted rooftops. Um, there's a lot that can be done and it's very much uh, to be done in harmony with what's happening beyond the cities, both in suburbs and in the wilder parts of the country. And thinking of great, uh, great swaths of the country as all connected together. So that's, a, that's an excellent question and the cities are not to be left out by any means. Thanks for that, Tony. So, um, Given your perspective on Belmara being a role, being a model in protecting 50% of our planet, what can other regions learn from Delmarva? I'm sorry, again, what? So given your perspective on Delmarva being oh, Delmarva. a model? Yeah, yeah. What, well, what can other regions learn from Delmarva? Extraordinary place because it is still so much uh, as it was. Uh, vast farmlands stretching to the horizon. It's almost big sky country like Montana, except it's right here on the East Coast. Um, and uh, buildings that are two and 300 years old and still a wealth of natural areas as well. Now, of course, we know that sea level rise is affecting the peninsula and it may well lose up to 10% of its land um, over the next 50, 60 years. So I guess when we talk about 50 per, saving 50%, we're talking about saving 50% of what doesn't get uh, covered by water. But that seems very doable because it's a landscape that's already 30% protected thanks to the efforts of the ESLC um, and the naturalists in the, uh, along the peninsula. And it's a place that as prime farmland, um, some of the best farmland on the East Coast that's left is within a day's drive of many of the big cities. So it could supplement the kind of farming that's done now by um, growing value added crops that could be come farmer's market uh, commodities for these big cities. There's so, so many possibilities, so much possibility. Uh, it's such an extraordinary place. And if you guys make a go of it, then you really are the prototype for a whole new set of green line landscapes all over the country, which is an amazing thing to look forward to. It would be a beautiful thing, that's for sure. 
Just Tony, we have a few more questions for you. Please. Um, so how do you promote natural resources conservation in ways that do not have the economic benefit that can be quantified? Well, um, that's an interesting subject because now that there's this convergence of thinking about climate change and uh, biodiversity protection, it turns out that land does a lot to protect us, protect the climate by keeping carbon stored instead of releasing it into the atmosphere. So there is an economic aspect even to the part that seems to have no economic as aspect. Also as a spectacular, beautiful landscape on the East Coast, um, this is a place that can begin to welcome tourists um, for a special kind of experience that is unavailable elsewhere. And because, boy, is it beautiful bicycling country because the tallest hill on the peninsula is 100 feet tall. So you can't go too, too far wrong in pedaling around. Yeah, I appreciate your answer to that one. I'm a bit of a cyclist myself, and I really appreciate <laughs> just the flat hills. Um, I mean, it's still a little hilly, but you know, there's nothing like you know some of the areas in you know the western parts of the country. So I definitely think that's a big draw. So I think we have time for one or two more questions. Absolutely. Um, this this question is from Wayne Bell. So he says, I get the impression that a green line park is a working landscape that includes a mix of active land use like farming or forestry and preserved habitats. What is the role of economic vitality in sustaining the future of greenhouse parks like Delmar Oasis? I ask this because there are many conservationists who advocate a hands-off approach to landscape, to landscape preservation. So you're talking about economic vitality? Um, yeah, what is the role of economic vitality in sustaining the future of greenhouse parks like Delmar Oasis? Well, I think it's, it's vital if you can't make a go of it economically, uh, not too many people are gonna wanna copy it, but uh, it is a matter of uh, retaining and, and enhancing the traditional uh, fishing and farming of the shore, which of course means protecting the water as well as the land. Uh, it is a matter of attracting the kind of uh, smaller businesses that the communities on the shore can support and sustain, um, as well as the kind of uh, recreational opportunities that could be afforded to, to visitors from up and down the East Coast. You don't have to go to Maine to have a wonderful place to look at. Uh, you can come to the Eastern Shore. That's so true. All right, Tony, I think we have time for one more question for you. Um, so I, I just want to ask, you know, knowing that you have a, a long history with the Delmarva Peninsula, um, having spent a lot of time here. Um, so I, I just want to ask, you know, in writing your book and then coming back to the peninsula and traveling and meeting with people here to get their perspectives, what surprised you, so what surprised you the most? Um, you know, how's your perspective changed over time about Delmarva? I think what I, I've been most sustained by was the passion for the place that I find in so many people uh, of all sorts all over the peninsula. And, and it's especially interesting to me that this kind of common purpose can emerge in a place which is more strangely uh, divided among three states than any other special landscape in the country. Um, the Mason-Dixon line chopped up this peninsula into th three entities where it was most of Delaware and it was just the tail end of Virginia and a little bit of, of uh, Maryland. Uh, and yet there's coherence here that you wouldn't expect to find in such uh, a divided place. And, and I, I see that growing every time I come back and to me, that's the kind of spirit that's going to really sustain all of the protection efforts that we're talking about, both in terms of uh, 
helping the plants and animals have a place to live and in terms of cleaning up the planet so that every species, including us, has a proper place to live. And, and, and that it's happening in a, that, that we're have, rearranging our thinking so that we realize that special places uh, are all within this amazing and wonderful, but very precariously constructed thing called the biosphere, which is so vast and yet so vulnerably thin from top to bottom. We all have to come to terms with that. Uh, and I think Delmarva is one of the great, one of making them one of the great starts on this. I think so too, Tony. Well, that's the last question that we have and I know you have to go, but um, I just want to thank you again for, for being a part of this, for your continued support, for being a great friend. Um, and I look forward to the next time we can see each other in person. It's been a while, so. Me too. This is the for now. Before I say goodbye, I've got to say that these recent tours of, of the peninsula have been made possible through the generosity of Darius Johnson, who drove me around. Uh, <laughs> a great traveling companion. Anytime, my friend. Anytime. It's a pleasure. I wish I could stay with you and, and listen to the rest of your panelists and have the wrap up conversation. But this, the fact that you're putting on a series as spectacular as this um, shows to me that you're well on your way. And Godspeed to you guys. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. I appreciate you. Bye for now. Bye. -bye. All right. So that was a great presentation that we had from our good friend, Tony Hiss. Um, and as he mentioned, his book, um, you know, it, it's, it's ready. You know, it's out there today. You can get it anywhere online. Uh, so we really encourage you to pick that up. And I know a couple of us at ESLC are doing the same. Um, so definitely stay tuned um, for future updates on Tony's book. Um, so next up, I want to introduce Liz Williams-Russell. Um, Liz, feel free to turn your camera on as I introduce you. Um, thank you for joining us. So Liz Williams Russell, she is the Climate Justice Program Director uh, for the Foundation for Louisiana. Her work interrogates the ways that land use, planning, and development solidify inequities, allowing tremendous variations in investment, social service, real estate valuation, criminalization, and access. She is committed to rooting out injustice and bringing about more healthy, just, and vibrant Louisiana. Liz has shared her unique knowledge having taught within the School of Architecture at Louisiana State University, the Department of Architecture and Landscape within the University of Greenwich in London, London College of Contemporary Art and Birmingham City University. Liz, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, with no further ado, it's all yours. Thank you so much for having me, Darius. I appreciate it. Um, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here with you all um, and excited uh, to share a little bit about ongoing climate justice work in Louisiana, uh, as well as how it's sort of evolved over the years and, and what's on the horizon. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, share my screen um, and, and share a bit about um, where we are and what we've got going on down here. Uh, so as Darius mentioned, I am Liz Williams-Russell. I'm the Climate Justice Program Director at Foundation for Louisiana. Foundation for Louisiana was actually started in the days immediately following Hurricane Katrina as Louisiana Disaster Recovery Foundation. And it was meant to be a philanthropic intermediary that could pull in resources from all over and get them out to communities on the ground that were being left out of the traditional philanthropic response, as well as left out of our institutional responses to disaster. Um, Foundation for Louisiana is at its core a racial justice organization, and I have the privilege of directing the climate justice portfolio. We also have targeted work to support inclusive economic opportunity through our community investment fund, uh, racial justice and healing work, criminal justice reform work, uh, and, and many other facets uh, of the foundation. Um, all that said, again, um, I'm trained as an architect. It is an accident that I ended up uh, in the field of philanthropy, but I will uh, say that uh, most of the crux of the challenges and opportunities that we face really exist 
uh, for me at the intersection of design and policy. Um, and for us to really be able to support our communities as we confront climate change, both in terms of impacts and causes, uh, it's really critical that we understand both how those design decisions are made and the policies that reinforce them, um, as well as how public will and narrative and the, the stories we tell ourselves sort of integrate with those decisions. Um, so with that, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview about the sort of landscape of Louisiana and the, the context and history uh, in our state, as well as um, some of the most more recent work that we've been a part of that ha uh, has really fed into what is our current climate justice strategy and, and the work that's on the horizon for the years to come. So. Um, for us in Louisiana, uh, we have to understand uh, the land's history, the systems of oppression that are in place have the power to dismantle harmful influences and also offer uh, policies and practices that are, are affirming of our collective humanity and beneficial to our people. Um, so most of Southern Louisiana was built by the Mississippi River over thousands of years. Um, at, we drain everything from the Rocky Mountains to Appalachia. 41% um, of the country comes down sort of through the Mississippi River um, and for millennia uh, was deposited throughout the dynamic landscape of coastal Louisiana uh, to building uh, new wetlands and, and cultivating a vibrant fishery. Um, indigenous peoples had no challenges um, existing amongst that. They so sort of various tribes, including the Atakapa, the United Home Nation, uh, the Choctaw, the Chinimacha, the Biloxi, uh, moved amongst these landscapes. Um, and it has only been in the recent centuries uh, that we have solidified the river's flow. Um, and seen tremendous land loss. We've actually lost more than the size of the state of Delaware um, since 1932 due to myriad natural and human caused uh, uh, impacts. Um, we see um, that the Mississippi River, both in terms of being levied and restricting that flow of freshwater and sediment out into the Delta landscape uh, has impacted uh, change. We see obviously the natural subsidence, saltwater intrusion, um, and coastal erosion that occurs as the delta uh, transforms. We also have permitted uh, pervasive industrial activity throughout coastal Louisiana, um, meaning that sea level rise and coastal land loss and increased flood risk are in no way a future scenario for the state of Louisiana. Um, it, it, climate change is ongoing here. Uh, it is hitting here in many ways sort of first, um, and we are already uh, dealing with the impacts of ongoing climate-induced migration um, and transition uh, in our communities and in our businesses accordingly. Um, you know, since Hurricane Katrina in 2005, we've had storm event after storm event. Um, and after the 2005 season uh, where Hurricanes Katrina and Rita really devastated all of coastal Louisiana, the state of Louisiana made a decision to invest in our coastal master plan. So we do have a, a, a plan that is updated every five or six years. Recently, it changed to six years, uh, but really to support coastal restoration and structural protection or risk reduction measures, as well as non-structural risk redu reduction measures. Um, that effort is ongoing, and I won't spend a lot of time talking about that today because there's plenty of ongoing information about that. Really, uh, what we have available um, at FFL and, and the work that we do is to support uh, the the work that addresses so many of the impacts and challenges and opportunities across other sectors that may not consider themselves environmental, but are deeply integrated with everything we care about in our communities. Um, so I also wanna highlight uh, the 80 mile stretch of the Mississippi River between New Orleans and Baton Rouge has the highest in, uh, concentration of industrial and petrochemical industry. Um, uh, it, it, highest concentration of the petrochemical industry in the country, and it's now famously known as Cancer Alley, uh, has actually been reclaimed by our frontline partners as Death Alley, uh, where there are uh, 
low income and predominantly black communities, 80% of the communities are black and 100% are low income where we see continued industrial expansion, both leading to climate change causing emissions as well as environmental racism in our communities. These layers of environmental racism are historic and though their shape has changed over time, the institutional and systemic nature uh, of these challenges is really consistent. Um, I mentioned the many storms that have occurred since 2005, uh, hurricanes Katrina, Rita, Gustav, Ike, Isaac, the BP oil spill. We had two heavy rainfall events in 2016. Um, and then just last year, Zeta, Delta, and Beta all hitting coastal Louisiana. Um, meaning that uh, I mention all of those storms because I want to highlight that every single parish in the state of Louisiana has been under at least one federal flood declaration in the last decade, and in many cases has been under five or six federal flood declarations um, in the last 10 to 15 years. And so uh, there are many impacts that we see to our communities that are much broader than those environmental changes that start to be addressed through the coastal master plan. Um, in many cases, residents with resources uh, are picking up and moving from areas they perceive as uh, risky to areas they perceive as higher and drier and safer communities. And so this has rippling effects on uh, the remaining communities, local tax bases. Um, in the areas losing population, we have a decline in availability to pay for social services, to invest in infrastructure to reduce risk, um, or to maintain existing infrastructure. Uh, through, through that local revenue. Um, we also see loss of local amenities, declining tax bases, um, loss of access to healthcare or jobs even. And then on the reverse of that, we also are seeing communities already grow in population according to where we're seeing folks move. Uh, so uh, schools over capacity, traffic swelling, housing and development permitting expanding really without any regard for where water already goes or where it is expected to go uh, with existing climate projections. Um, and so again, the, the work that we do really covers a, a broad breadth of uh, of, of that set of challenges um, and, and questions. We also work with an explicit understanding that black communities, indigenous communities, communities of color and low income communities are more likely to live and work near the uh, toxic facilities that emit pollutants and shorten and impact quality of life, more likely to reside in areas where there's more flooding, more likely to receive inadequate uh, infrastructure investment to actually mitigate risk and prevent disasters. And then also they experience insufficient um, and delayed recovery and response investments both during and after disaster. So those are just a few of the ways that sort of institutionalized bias um, and racism shows up in our policies and practices and really influences and exacerbates the existing inequities that are built into our communities. Um, so our vision uh, at the Foundation for Louisiana towards climate justice is that everyday people actually have the opportunity to connect their personal experience of environmental change to different pathways uh, to address those changes and support action in their communities. Uh, we want to see our community-based organizations having the space and resources to collaborate and design and actually move uh, concrete climate, racial, and economic justice goals. Uh, we want to see government leaders that actually understand the implications of the changing climate and genuinely work with impacted communities to ensure that those uh, that have been marginalized and disadvantaged are, are key designers and decision-making uh, peoples at the table in terms of how we deal with these uh, challenges and opportunities. Finally, we want to ensure that our businesses thrive and create good, stable jobs for Louisianans, uh, that we reduce our economic disparities, and we support inclusive, healthy economies um, to build talent and wealth here in Louisiana. Um, I want to start by touching on a program that uh, is, has been one of our key pillars, both as a way to uh, build relationships, uh, to build trust, to build partnerships, to support networks of actors across the state. Um, you know, when we uh, doubled down on coastal resilience and climate work um, about five or six years ago now, uh, we, excuse me, we were hearing from our partners like, look, we don't want to hear this information from folks that are outside of our communities. We want to hear this from people we know and trust. You know, I want 
my neighbor, my friend, my colleague to be the person that I can talk to about these challenges and, and work with to solve for them. Um, so we developed the Lead the Coast program, which is a spinoff of the Foundation for Louisiana's Together initiative. Uh, LEAD stands for Leadership, Education, Advocacy, Development. Uh, and some of you may have heard my colleague, Aste Davis, speak about this program. Uh, it's actually a four Saturday program, again, where we try to engage folks who may identify as leaders, but maybe not coastal or environmental or climate leaders and ensure that they have the tools and the resources and the space to connect um, and, and actively work to support their communities. Uh, the content of these program, this program includes sort of coastal and climate 101, like how did we get here, as well as race power and privilege training uh, and who the government players are, like what do they actually do? When do you go to your local parish planning office? Uh, when do you go to your state, uh, different state agencies or your different federal agencies? And then we also provide facilitation training, organizing training and advocacy training. Uh, we actually just finished our first virtual cohort of this program, but we've run the program now seven times um, and have uh, about 140 graduates of the program um, and increasingly a, a, a network of allies across Louisiana who are figuring out priorities together um, and, and figuring out at an individual and, and sort of shared level, how do, we, how do we advance change in our communities? Um, I also want to highlight the LA Safe program. Um, one of the things that, uh, in addition to the Coastal Master Plan, we needed to see from our state agencies was an understanding of the myriad ways that coastal and climate change impact our communities. Uh, so um, back in 2016, we had some specific funding to uh, uh, to respond to some of the critiques we were hearing from our partners that like, look, by the time we see a plan, all the decisions have already been made outside of our community. Uh, we want to be at the table from point zero, not brought in when a plan is already almost complete and solidified. Um, and so uh, at Foundation for Louisiana, we said, okay, well, what does that look like? Um, from a purely logistical perspective, like how many meetings do we have? At what scale are those meetings? Are they community or parish-wide or regional? Um, what are the barriers that keep people from being a part of these processes and how do we overcome them? So simple, simple enough things like childcare and food and transportation, um, ensuring language access uh, for our Vietnamese, Cambodian and Latinx communities, um, and really making sure uh, that, that our our Louisiana folks were the people who were able to facilitate these conversations. So we actually had Lead the Coast graduates um, provided stipends to be the facilitators of these public meetings in partnership with the state of Louisiana. Um, over the course of 2017, we had five rounds of public meetings. Um, and we had more than 70 public meetings and, and just under about 3,000 unique participants, meaning that if you came to multiple meetings, we didn't count you twice. Um, but we actually identified 10 projects that would receive public investment in partnership with the state of Louisiana. And these were selected um, by Louisiana constituents. So um, this was the first time that Louisiana actually invested in projects that were selected by the general public. Uh, we had online voting for three weeks that was available um, parish by parish. And then we also had in-person meetings uh, where people could use a set of multicolored tokens to prioritize which projects out of a suite of potential projects that had been developed over um, the program that they actually wanted to see in their communities. Uh, so those projects really vary. Some are, are really stormwater management, green infrastructure based. There's also a business incubator, expansion of mental health care services in areas losing population, um, an affordable housing prototype that can deal with flood water, a safe harbor for fishermen. Um, we also have a set of policy recommendations that evolved from this process. And if you'd like more information on the LA Safe program in particular, you can learn more at lasafe.la.gov. Um, but really this is a, a key example of how to, um, how to do public engagement in partnership with community um, and build on that public input to get to tangible policy shifts and recommendations and outcomes that um, in areas that, that really are, may not be considered environmental. So sectors like housing and development or transportation or education, economy and jobs, um, those areas that we know are impacted by coastal and climate change, but where those state agencies or decision makers may not already have a roadmap for how to engage in, in the work. Um, 
So following the LA Safe process and, and, and really in the last couple of years, the Foundation for Louisiana has refined our goals and outcomes for change in order to build on our tremendous learnings from the LA Safe process. Um, we invest to build people power, advance just policies, and cultivate new narratives. Uh, um, that new narrative to actually activate statewide um, statewide engagement on climate action. Like what does it mean to have the public will to move climate action? Um, we also recognize that there are many places we could invest, um, but where do we think is gonna have the greatest potential for a change? And so our priority areas right now are equitable development, environmental justice and economic opportunity. And I'll talk just a little bit more about what that looks like. Um, from an economic opportunity standpoint, the state of Louisiana through the Coastal Master Plan is investing billions of dollars in coastal restoration and water management infrastructure. Other state agencies are also moving massive contracts to restore our coast, to rebuild wetlands, to reconnect and establish that dynamic delta landscape that can help us mitigate sea level rise um, and increase flood risk. Um, how do we also take advantage of the emerging energy sectors growing in the state of Louisiana? So how do we cultivate inclusive economic opportunity uh, and ensure um, that Louisiana people are getting access to these, uh, these job opportunities, business opportunities that are created through the procurement of, uh, of contracts at the state level? Um, additionally, in terms of environmental justice, we see a continued industrial build out in areas that are vulnerable to climate impacts. Um, we also see continued expansion of environmental racism and harm to communities. So how do we actually understand those regulatory and permitting processes and shift them to reduce both uh, climate change causing emissions as well as um, harm and toxicity in our communities? How do we make sure that those communities impacted are actually part of the ways to restore um, uh, uh, and the decisions that are made there? And then also how do we limit future use in those low flood risk areas so that we're well poised to adapt in our communities instead of um, just responding to industry? Uh, finally, in terms of equitable development, um, I mentioned earlier the ongoing climate-induced migration that's occurring in Louisiana. Um, so how do we preserve affordability and, and insurability while also understanding the ways that insurability or access to capital expanding housing and development in higher flood risk areas actually induces our risk over time? Um, how do we preserve um, and create inclusive communities in areas that are poised to remain high and dry? Um, and support inclusive access to housing that is affordable in those low flood risk areas? And how do we, um, in, in whatever way possible, how do we reduce predatory land acquisition where some of our communities in those high risk areas are having uh, their land sort of bought out from under them without an understanding of the value inherent there in the face of climate change? Um, so with that, I'll just uh, you know thank y'all again for including me, um, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, and and be a part of any conversation on um, any of these these little intros I've shared. Thanks so much for that, Liz. So we definitely have some questions for you, and I just want to reiterate, um, you know, if you do have any questions, please use the Q and A feature. Uh, my colleagues and I are looking out for that. So um, the first question that I have is, um, how do you work with key stakeholders who have the resources that vulnerable communities need but aren't really keen on climate justice initiatives? Um, so specifically, how do you build common ground and understanding? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, we try to uh, use um, the entry point of, of a love and concern for our communities and for, for the state that we live in. Um, you know, half of our meetings, we start with what, it, what do you love about Louisiana, just as an introductory question, um, because people so often, if you're in government versus if you're in community, see themselves as on these two opposing sides of an issue and really can't see themselves as, as related to one another. When in, all, in actuality, the folks who are in government are part of these communities too um, and influenced by these decisions, even if they're not occurring in their community directly. Um, and so, you know, I know this sounds sort of romantic, but, but what does it look like to cultivate an understanding of shared destiny, right? Um, this is not, you know, this is not a, a question of whether this will happen, but 
if when it when it happens when some of our communities are disappear into the sea you know um because of the coastal master plan we have a really sophisticated understanding of the extent of land loss we should expect with different sea level rise scenarios and different capacities to restore our coast so what does it mean to actually know that and respect the experience of the communities that have been watching watching land disappear around to them for excuse me, decades and generations. Um, and so, so really trying to cultivate that common ground uh, because ultimately, you know, this is about the future of our families and our communities and our neighborhoods. Great, I appreciate that. So the next question we have, um, and this has a bit of a lead in. So in spite of all of our similarities, Maryland's Eastern Shore is very different from coastal Louisiana in one QA. Most people in our region who live in waterfront or flood prone areas are among our wealthiest residents. And it would be at least a decade before our vulnerable and marginalized residents find themselves at risk of chronic flooding and climate impacts. So what would you tell Eastern Shore planners and elected officials who want to plan for the future and address risk for those vulnerable today, not a decade from now? That is a really great question. Um, I think, uh, the speed of trust is slow, I'll say. And um, I will say that these are generational challenges and they're challenges that frankly are have to be addressed in partnership with people. Um, when we had the LA Safe process, we used this notion of, of generations and like 10 years from now, 25 years from now, 50 years from now, what are the impacts we expect to see? Because so much of our coastal planning is done like 50 years out, right? The coastal master plan is a 50 year, $50 billion plan. And for a lot of folks, they're like, I'm gonna be dead and gone by that point. I, that is not my concern, right? Um, and, and so we tried to, to break that down a little bit. And we said, okay, well, 10 years from now, maybe you're thinking about yourself. Maybe you're thinking about your kids, right? 25 years from now, Maybe you're thinking about yourself, but probably you're thinking about your kids and your grandkids. 50 years from now, most people in the room, we're not thinking about ourselves. We're thinking about our kids, our grandkids, and the generations that come after. So what do you want the future to look like for them? And how do we start to plan, acknowledge that this is the best information that we have available. Here's how it connects to our personal experiences. Now, what does that mean? What do you wanna see? What do you love about your community? What needs to be preserved? And also what could be better and what could be improved? And how is this planning process actually a part of um, asking those questions and interrogating um, improvement? We, you know, in Louisiana, we're, notoriously struggle with change. We love our culture and our food and festivals and way of life um, here. And, you know, just, just like how you start a gumbo, we'll start a, you know, 45 minute debate um, in our, in our communities. Um, but how do, how do we actually like use that as an entry point, use the things that people love about the place that we live in as a way uh, to, to start to together speak realistically about what's possible. Um, I think uh, to, the, to the point about, you know, marginalized communities may not be impacted for a longer amount of time. Um, if, if we could have had time to start now, uh, because people with resources are more financially able to adapt. Um, they're more able, you know, just after a storm event, if, if, if one resident had two feet of water in their house for a flood event and they have access to credit or um, uh, can easily uh, move some cash around and go to Home Depot or go to Lowe's and get sheetrock and start repairing their home, they're in a vastly different place than somebody who couldn't get to work, therefore lost their job, um, does, it doesn't have the credit to be able to put that sheetrock on a credit card and is just waiting for whatever disaster recovery resources might come whenever the FEMA official finds out that they're still around. You know, it's a totally different experience. Um, and so for me, that means we need to be investing in those places that are on the front lines, even if they're further out, uh, that because there is less of the financial infrastructure to adapt, it's that much more important to center those communities now and not wait for like when they're gonna get impacted. Um, I struggle this, I get brought up, you know, 
in the before times before the pandemic, I used to be going out to California to speak all the time. And I was always like, you guys have the most adorable challenges. Like 20 years from now, like four millionaires, their houses are going to fall into the water. Like I can't, it's so different than Louisiana. And I hear that. Um, and also there are so many impacts to our communities and it is generational capacity that is required to prepare for these challenges. So we need to be investing now in the places that are not gonna be economically poised to just deal with it and just adapt and just finance their way out of um, that next piece. So this, this question um, is kind of a follow up to that and it, it's a little bit romanticized I'll say, but um, I just wanna ask you, how can people in vulnerable areas like coastal Louisiana, coastal Delmarva, coastal Florida, how can they stay op or optimistic and engaged in the fight and you know just our efforts to adapt to climate change? Or how are they staying optimistic and engaged in your region? Um, I'm going to be honest. You know, I feel like I feel like folks are tired. Um, I feel like uh, you know it's like everybody's just trying to make it, especially in the context of the pandemic um, and just trying to like <laughs> keep the lights on sort of mentally and, and, and emotionally as well as, as, as physically. Um, and so it, it, it is really tough. I would say what I see that's giving folks the most energy in Louisiana is knowing that they're not doing this by themselves. And the more isolated that folks are, whether it's like an individual organization that's like, we're the only people in this place that's saying the thing, um, the more isolated that they are, the more exhausted that they feel. Um, and so I see tremendous strength and potential in these sort of constellations of relationships that we have emerging. Um, and in some cases they're emerging around like X, Y, Z set of things is, is being talked about at the state of Louisiana and they're asking for public input. And like, there's four organizations that work with different networks of people and different communities and they're trying to work together on it. And there's almost like a solidarity in, in being able to do that together. But there's also, I think some of those same individuals who are playing leadership roles at those organizations are almost being sounding boards for each other. There's like a, like, I don't know how I ended up being this person who has to know all this information, but at least I get to talk to you and you and you, and we get to all share about where we are, because again, we are a part of these communities, right? This is personal. Um, this is, this is my house too. This is my future too. This is my family and where, where my, um, where my kid will get to live or not. Um, and the culture that they'll get to see or might have washed away. Um, or, you know, the, the language and accents that will disappear, um, or the ways of cooking and battling about how you make a roux and to start that gumbo that are so different from Bayou to Bayou. Um, so it, for me, it's the relationships um, and knowing that we're in this together. That's also a romantic answer to you, Darius, but that, that, that's what's giving people energy. Yeah, that, that's powerful perspective. We're all social beings. We need each other. We got to come together on this stuff, find that common ground. So I'm totally feeling what you're saying. Um, I do want to ask, you know, kind of go a little bit deeper on a specific, uh, specific example, really. Um, I'm just curious to know if you have any specific examples of, you know, communities who have dealt with that struggle to survive and just the need to stay engaged and optimistic and if they've been able to turn that into some type of silver lining. Um, do you have any examples of that? Um, yeah, I will uh, I'll highlight the leadership of the Poinashen uh, Indian tribe uh, in Terrebonne Parish in South Louisiana. Um, there has been, so, so this is an area of South Louisiana that doesn't have a levy, um, y'all may know, you know, some, so many of our communities have different levies that have been built over different time periods uh, that reduce risk for some folks and not for others. But this particular area has really been just sort of watching the land disappear around them for, for decades and generations. Um, and that there's these different sort of individual and community-based adaptation measures that have evolved over time. Like, I mean, wonky policy, 
adaptation measures, right? But it's like, uh, you know, um, the Point of Shen tribe has built these elevated vegetable gardens uh, to where when there's a high tide and the water comes into their community, they don't lose their whole um, community vegetable garden, right? So there's like these, these things that they, they've designed to be able to adapt to that particular instance. You know, people just tie up a piro, which is, uh, you know, a Cajun vocabulary for a canoe or, <laughs> um, or a little wooden skiff, but people just tie up piros to their house. And, and it's like, okay, well, this is how I know I'm adapting um, in this place. Um, it's, it's time limited you know, because it's like, it depends on how fast the water encroaches and whether or not the next storm comes to this community or goes a few parishes over. Um, but there are things that like make it that much more um, tolerable and, uh, and the ability to like maintain your culture and your place for as long as you can. Um, yeah, I, I think there again, it's like, it's, 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 the relationships in community that are giving that silver lining. Right, right. I appreciate that. So I want to ask a question about climate migration. Um, and really, I just want to understand from your perspective, when are people typically prompted to retreat due to climate threats? So really, you know, when is enough enough? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it feels like a particular, I've been talking about this a lot in the last year um, with different folks because this question comes up a lot. Um, so from a, from a sort of evidence-based uh, perspective, and there's more information on this at lasafe.la.gov, but also we've invested in some different research around the population movement thresholds and, and when those occur. Um, because it's people above a certain income level um, who tend to move and that income level varies, but you can kind of see the patterns from geography to geography uh, above a certain income level here, but then below a certain income level, because once you get above X, Y, Z amount uh, of, of money per year in terms of salary, you usually have the resources to self mitigate um, and stay where you are for a certain period of time and then below a certain income threshold um, you're sort of stuck right and you can't make the decision to move and you can't take a hit or like maybe your property has been passed down for generations so there's no like selling it and it because uh, uh, there's no clear title and because it doesn't have any value in the context of land loss and flood risk um, and so there's these that there's sort of trends that are occurring. Again, the people with resources are the pe people who can afford to pick up and move up until a certain point. And then those people can afford to stay or self-insure. Um, so, so there's a sort of data points. There's also anecdotally, like there's differences in risk tolerances, right? And I think we see this with the pandemic, right? Um, you know, you see, a different level, like people have very different levels of risk that they're willing to expose themselves. You, you know, everybody might, there's a sort of array of people. There's folks who uh, during the pandemic have since the start been getting groceries delivered and like stayed in their house and never leave and never see anybody and only do virtual conversations. And like, that's the level of risk that I can handle, right? To not expose myself and my family. Then there's folks that are like, okay, like I go out, you know, I have gone to eat somewhere outside and I've always worn a mask and I've always followed the protocols uh, to keep my family safe. But like, we still only see our pod of six people and, you know, and that's slightly like, okay, it's a little riskier, you know, and then you have this sort of spectrum and then you get to folks that are like, I haven't changed a thing. I've never worn a mask. I don't believe this is real. I've been outside doing my thing and I see everybody and I haven't got sick or four people have died in my family. And this, right. It's like, it's such a spectrum. Um, and, and it's, and it's, <laughs> it's this real psychological set of, of, of condition. Like where, where, where do you fall? What is the level of risk you're, you're beginning to tolerate? I mean, uh, or you're able to tolerate. And I feel like, you know, I'm from New Orleans. I live inside the Levee District. Uh, my husband and I own a house uh, in Baton Rouge, which is on high ground an hour and 10 minutes away, um, a few blocks from where my brother and my mom have moved. Um, but for us, it's like, we want to live in New Orleans. We want to keep staying here. That, based on what I do and what we know, we're not going to 
pass on property in New Orleans to our kids as an inheritance, it won't have value. But does that mean we never want to buy here? We ha we've decided like we might have to think of it as a purchase and not an investment. It, you know, it, it, it won't grow in value over time, but we're going to get a ton of enjoyment out of it. Like, but like, okay, are we going to buy in an area that's more likely to flood? And ha right, you sort of, we all have these ways that we triangulate the level of risk that we're willing to handle for ourselves individually, for our families, um, and, and, and where that falls. And then it, it gets even bigger when we get to neighborhood or community. What is the level of risk we're all willing to tolerate? And I think then there are thresholds of going back to those data points at the societal level, right? Where it's like, well, you, Liz, may feel comfortable thinking of your house as a purchase and not an investment, but the financial institutions that create that opportunity for you may not, right? And so when do all those thresholds start to fall into place? Um, it's, as we all know, who work in this space, it's extraordinarily complex and an and existential crisis um, that frankly, at a national level um, and a global level, I would say we are barely touching the tip of the spear of the beginnings of these conversations and their implications for our lives and the things we love. Don't mean to be a doubt, but I, I guess everyone in this field knows knows this stuff, but yeah. Well, this perspective that I definitely resonate with and I think a lot of people in the call resonate with too. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, and we actually have a follow-up question on migration, kind of coming back up to that societal level so the question is, is this phenomenon organic? Like are people up and leaving on their own accord or does the government play a role in moving people? And should they? Yeah, um, so there, most of this is organic. Thanks for that question. Um, there have been uh, a couple of initiatives in the state of Louisiana that have gotten various levels of public attention. Um, so many of you will have heard about the Il de Jean Charles Resettlement Project. Um, it, the focus it's gotten in national and global media is frankly like a lot less nuanced than the, the reality on the ground. Um, but uh, it is, you know, it's extremely challenging, uh, right? And, and uh, folks who have all the best intentions um, across the board, whether it's uh, um, multiple tribal chiefs who have uh, some of the residents and, and, and tribal members on the island uh, or members of government who are trying to support uh, the, the, the sort of transitioning away from one place and the establishing a new community in a new place that's poised to thrive. Um, there's all the best intentions. Um, and also our government, you know, there's lots of questions around like, are we resourced? Are, is our infrastructure of our governance system actually stood up in ways that are equipped to do this? Um, and the answer <laughs> so far is, is generally like, no, our government, our governance systems at various levels of government are not stood up in ways that can answer the complexity of these questions, right? Um, and in Louisiana, we have multiple state agencies who are like, don't talk to me about the thing because that's not my job, right? This is my job. And who can blame them? Because it's like we've divested from government for so long uh, that that one staff person is supposed to do 18 jobs and they're supposed to handle like the existential crisis of, of an entire community and be able to do that in a way that honors the history and the complexity of that landscape and sets them up for a new life. Like we're our systems aren't built uh, to, to do this. So one of our partners is actually, one of our nonprofit partners and grantees is actually um, working with all of the state agencies in Louisiana to basically go, what is your mission? Um, what are your existing programs, existing investments, existing assets? How are, they, how are those things gonna be impacted by climate change and coastal change? And how can we, uh, adjust or expand what is the mission and values and, and, and processes of your organization and your agency in order to better accommodate for those things, even if not perfect. Um, and then also how do we understand that agency and that one and that one and that one and actually all of these state agencies are part of this bigger puzzle. Um, but this is just the beginning of work. Again, this is where I come back to the generational nature of these challenges um, to really face, you know, the, the questions because like 
our Office of Health and Hospitals is not thinking about at a systems level, the uh, mental health impacts of storm after storm after storm and or watching land disappear around you and the societal shifts that are occurring in those communities. They're also at the same time, not thinking about um, healthcare access even in areas losing population or how to prepare for growing population in other areas. You know, to transition to another state agency, like our Department of Transportation manages our floodplains. They don't pay attention to the horizontal movement of water. <laughs> So like what, you know, no agency it is within their current mission and scope to just handle even the, the, the more specific questions, much less we're talking about a massive relocation, both organically and facilitated of thousands, or if not hundreds of thousands or millions of our residents. Um, so there's a whole different question set of questions I feel like we need to be asking ourselves around the call to action from government um, and what that looks like at different scales and where is government actually capable of doing this work and how do we support our community-based governance structures and our community-based decision making um, to move our own self-determination Uh, we have time for one more question. Um, so we, we talked about the, the importance of relationships and we've talked about this the, the dichotomy um, with climate adaptation between you know the wealthy but then also the less, less affluent resource deprived communities. Um, so I'm just curious to know how can more uh, how can the more affluent communities actually work with those resource deprived communities for this collective climate adaptation efforts? You know, especially those communities that, you know, right adjacent, you know, some of those wealthy property owners or, um, you know, however it might line up. That's a great question. Um, for, for me, it goes back to policy and the types of like zoning and land use decisions that we make at the county or parish level oftentimes. You know, many of our states around the country don't have a statewide planning office or statewide land use decision-making or zoning and ordinance um, sort of structures. Uh, and, and that's a real place where um, wealth distribution is, is in some cases determined or influenced by uh, um, that, th those, those types of decisions. Uh, so for example, you know, uh, wealthier communities standing in solidarity with the low income community that's likely to receive XYZ new petrochemical facility or industrial build out, um, you know, instead of we don't want it in our backyard, but I'm not worried about wherever else it might show up. Um, you know, <laughs> how do we actually see ourselves as connected in that? Um, and, and see some of those decisions as, as bigger. You know, how do we, it, it's, this, is a, this is such a crisis of our country right now, obviously, but like, you know, when we're talking about questions about, you know, transit access and how do I, how do I be able to get to a job? How do, how do I, as a person who could afford to take, I have my car, right? I can drive to work. How do I understand that that doesn't mean everybody can? And it's important that there's access to public transit to get to that economic opportunity, which might not end up in that community. Like it, we're, we're so disconnected um, from being able to see that shared destiny and the collectivism as opposed to what do I need for my community to be independent or my family to be able to be okay? Um, you know, we're not apart from the places we live. We are a part of those places. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it matters that we can see ourselves as that. Um, I think the only way to get there though, is frankly relationships, relationships across those places. So for us with the Lead the Coast program, it's been really critical um, to get community leaders to be a part of that work who, um, from a part across some of those spectrums, uh, low income communities, as well as the wealthier communities, um, uh, understanding a bit of the nuance of the, the relationships between black communities or indigenous communities that exist in Louisiana, ensuring they're both there, you know, ensuring that there's, there's bridges and that those bridges are being formed through relationships and through 
actually my personal experience isn't that far from your personal experience and how do we actually create the space for those those conversations thank you so much for that liz and um yeah that's our last question so i just want to say thank you so much for your presentation for your candid perspective and your honesty um as i said before i, I think it's something that resonates with all of us and we all can learn a lot from and a lot of us just starts with checking ourselves, looking in the mirror and recognizing that we all do have a shared common cause with this. Um, so again, really appreciate you. And- um, Thank you, Darius. Yeah. Thank sure. you for having me. It's a pleasure, it's a pleasure. Sure won't be the last time. All right, so um, on that note, I wanna introduce um, my colleague, Jim Bass again. Um, he's going to be facilitating the, the group Q&A that we spoke about earlier, which presenters from the previous workshops are going to join us. Um, you can ask any of those burning questions that you have left over, and um, we're just going to keep the conversation going. So on that note, Jim, it's all yours. Thank you, Darius. Uh, I'm going to remind all of our participants uh, on the call this evening that we're going to be handling this through the Q&A function. Uh, down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, so feel free to go ahead and drop questions in. Uh, just flag, uh, you know, as you're putting the questions in, um, make sure to indicate uh, whether your question is directed towards all of our panelists or a few of our panelists or just one person individually. Um, we, we've got some questions prepared, but really this is all about expanding the engagement opportunity between our participants and our speakers. Um, so for the speakers, I'm going to uh, reintroduce everybody to the whole group. Um, as I call your name, please go ahead and turn on your camera and feel free to unmute yourself and we'll start diving into the questions. Uh, so from our very first workshop, uh, we've got uh, Paula Ehrlich with the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation. Thanks for being with us, Paula. Uh, we've got Don Bosch with UMSEAS. Don, thanks for being with us tonight. Good to see you again, Paula. Uh, for our second workshop, uh, we've got Laura Linick uh, with the uh, Cultivating Resilience Organization. And Hi there, uh, good to be with you tonight. Hey, thanks for being with us, Laura. And we've got uh, Trey Hill with Harborview Farms out in Rock Hall. Good to see you again, Trey. Um, from our third workshop, we've got Katie Svidlieri with the Georgetown Climate Center. Welcome back, Katie. And we have Khalil Kettering uh, from the Nature Conservancy's Maryland DC chapter. Thanks for being with us again. And I think you guys will remember most recently, Liz Williams-Russell from the Foundation of Louisiana. All right. Um, so again, please use the Q&A function uh, to ask questions of our participants. Um, I've got a few here ready to go. Um, all of these questions that I've got are directed for all of our panelists. So um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna order in the order or anything like that. So uh, let's just dive in and have some conversation. Uh, the first question that I've got for everybody this evening is what is the greatest challenge you face in your job on a regular basis? And how can we as advocates for environmental protection and climate resilience help? Well, I'll, I'll break the ice and um, I, I just want to say, um, Liz, I've, I've, we haven't met, but I'm, I'm a native of New Orleans and lived in Terrebonne Parish where, that you talked about, where the Point of Shen community is and so on for a decade. And so uh, I, I was almost in tears listening <laughs> to you describing the, 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 the threat we're under. And so I've gone full circle in my job for, for almost uh, 27 years, I managed a research program in the University of Maryland dealing with the Chesapeake Bay, dealing with the Eastern Shore. And I guess we, you know, we had some of the same frustrations that you did, getting people to listen to reality, listen to the hard evidence and so on. And so after I retired from that, I'm actually now working with the National Academies of Science uh, on the Gulf Research Program. And we're actually going to bring our resources and talent to and, and the scientific talent to kind of address some of the problems of the Gulf Coast. So I think there I think there are some very interesting parallels between what Liz talked about and what we see on the eastern shore. 
they're, they're in warp speed. Things are happening much more rapidly there. But in many ways, the same things are happening on the Eastern shore. So the same challenges that Liz talked about of getting people to understand the common threats that we all exist, understanding that some people have the capacity to deal with the, the changes that are upon us and more than others. I mean, are, those are all very common themes. The one thing that, that um, we don't share is that we don't have the other big challenge in coastal Louisiana of, of this big dependence, economic dependence, historical dependence on oil. And so in Louisiana, they're dealing with now with this existential crisis, but also realizing that, that they have to stop producing all of this fossil fuel energy. We in Maryland are also dealing with this. I think many of you know we have a, we're debating in Annapolis now about whether to, to set our greenhouse gas reduction goals, be more aggressive than not. Governor Edwards in Louisiana is also taking this on really kind of amazingly for a Southern state governor to address both this, you know, the threat of climate change as well as the need to do something about it. So I think there's a lot of commonalities in, in exchanging ideas and challenges that, that we can pursue. I would just say, uh, following on Liz's comments about uh, embracing a shared destiny and understanding that we're all in this together, I, I would say from my perspective, that's a really difficult uh, nut to crack. Uh, we're a very individualist society. All of our systems are set up in that way. And so I, I think that uh, going forward, uh, something else that Liz said that I really appreciated was the government's not set up to do this and how we're gonna have to rethink how we actually make decisions. And uh, for example, I'm wondering about how mutual aid societies might be able to be retooled or repurposed or that idea be repurposed so that we begin to bring community kind of grassroots efforts into play as another, not, not to replace, but as another um, tool for beginning to do this kind of longer term thinking, planning, visioning that's needed. I think there's a, there's a two part answer to your question, Jim. And the first part for me is, is internal and it's quite simply burnout. Burnout's one of the biggest challenges because there's so many things for us to tackle when we're looking at sustainability and environmental issues. And by the nature of our work, we want to tackle all of them, but you can't. And especially now with like the pandemic, I'm finding myself, oh, 11 o'clock at night, let me bang out emails. And there's always this drive to want to push the solution forward. And sometimes to the point where you're draining your capacity so much because we're tackling one of the biggest challenges in the history of humankind. And then on the second side, the flip side of that on the external is that environmental challenges have an intersection with every single part of our society. And figuring out ways to work within and around that, and especially when as conservationists and conservation groups, we've built so many decades of this great strategy of focusing just on myopic conservation that is no longer uh, a, a strategy that works. When we're thinking about things like social justice and equity and all these things and how it fits into how we deal with the environment. And we're wrestling right now with how does that work? How do we deal with things like the racial injustices and all these things that our, our society and our country is built on and land stolen away from people? that also is connected to our conservation. And we don't have the answers to that, but it's a, it's a really big challenge because it's this combination of these wicked problems, social inequities and injustices and environmental challenges that are built and layered on top of each other. I think building on Laura and Khalil's points, um, two of the challenges I think I confront a lot in my work, which deals with coastal adaptation and resilience, is shaping an accurate narrative and shaping expectations of communities that you work with. Um, so for example, um, some of the work I do deals with managed retreat or climate migration, relocation, whatever you wanna call it. 
And some of the people that dominate the narrative are the ones that say, no one's gonna live on the coast and everyone's gonna move to Minnesota in 50 years. That's not gonna happen. And so how can we create a more productive dialogue by letting people know here is actually sort of more of the risk you're facing, here are the tools and opportunities and choices you're presented with across the spectrum. There's not gonna be a one size fits all approach to coastal adaptation and resilience. Let's have a dialogue with communities and figure that out. Um, and I think also building off Khalil's point, it, there's shaping expectations in terms of the long-term and complicated nature of these problems. And so you have to have sort of small bites at the apple and that may not mean progress to somebody else, um, but if you can sort of show them how that fits into the bigger picture of things that might resonate with them more um, because you start small and then hopefully you can make it bigger, but that small progress still means something to the people that you're helping. Ray or Paula, would y'all like to chime in? Um, I mean, I hit it from a little different perspective. For me, it's more of a, if you talk about day to day, I'm probably a little farther out in the weeds. And for me, it's trying to internalize all this. I agree with Cleo on the, on the burnout, but every decision you make as a farmer has a direct impact on the environment and climate change, but it also has a direct impact on your financials and the complexity of your life and the complexity that you're embracing within the profession. So trying to internalize where to prioritize everything becomes very difficult. Um, you know, is, is it, you know, if I do tillage on this field, my life will be easier. But if I do tillage, I'm going to release the carbon in the air that was sequestered by the plants in the soil. Um, so even though that's just a very small example, but it's like that with everything, you know, how much fuel do we burn? What moisture do we pick the corn? Um, you know, how do I make sure that I have a diverse workforce? How do I make sure that my team's diverse? How do I make sure that you know, what I'm doing is the right thing. But then at the end of the day, it's, wait a second, do I have enough money to, to <laughs> am I making money? Um, you know, which is not a, a greed aspect, but when you're trying to stay efficiency and you're in commodity markets and all these different things, there's a lot of different things pulling. And we get a lot of, or I get a lot of folks, you know, that are experts in everything. So you have, you know, my fertility people, you've got pesticides, you've got uh, no-till and runoff, you've got carbon sequestration, we've got biological diversity, we've got, you know, I've got landowners that I have to, that are my bosses that I have to cater to, um, you know, marketing on, you know, commodities, that sort of thing. So I, I agree with all of it, but it just becomes, there's so many different pain points within the, the agricultural sector, or, I mean, I enjoy it, but it's joy points, whatever you want to call it, but trying to, to wait and prioritize can often be, you um, a bit overwhelming. And I think a lot of times it's hard to embrace climate and environment when you have all these other day-to-day -day tasks going on, which I, I think is very relatable to everyone here, but just kind of mine's probably a little more um, literal or a little, you know, a little more actually on the ground. If I could just jump in here to say what I'm hearing from everybody is this is really big, complex problems and how do we manage day to day or short term while keeping the big picture in mind? And I, I'm, my background is in agriculture. Um, and I think that there's something that ha has been developed within agriculture that might really be useful. And it's a way of managing challenges or managing systems called holistic management. And um, what it does is gives you some pretty simple tools to allow you to get what you need to get done that's right in front of you while keeping in mind the big picture. And in my experience, uh, mostly I'm speaking now to resilience planning, community resilience planning. What is really the, the skills that are missing in communities in our culture is the ability to vision that big picture and then to navigate towards that desired future with day to day. We don't, we don't have either one of those skills. We don't very well in this, in this culture think together about how we want to live. And if we can get there, we don't have very good skills about, about how to work in community to make that happen. So both of those things are missing, um, but they're both skills that can be learned. Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Laura. I, I, I was actually thinking a, a, we're really talking about core values, right? Um, and 
there's a lot of themes that that have come up through Tony's uh, talk um, uh, as well. Uh, and the one that strikes me maybe is the most important is courage. Um, I happen to uh, work with a, a scientist, E.O. Wilson, who that's probably the, the biggest core value he's had to have his his whole life, right? Having the courage to continue to focus on uh, research uh, leadership that al that's in, that allows us to be in service of a resilient planet, right? And, we, and we've talked about other values beyond courage, like hope and, and beauty and tradition and passion or pride of place as being other things that motivate us and communities that we're working with to uh, a, a achieve uh, uh, extraordinary things, really, right? But it's that focus and courage that's sort of resonating with me right now that really we all need to carry um, and that allows us to uh, continue to inspire informed collective action, right, to care for the planet. I really appreciate that perspective, Paula. Uh, and that tees us up nicely for our second question, which is kind of the flip side of the, the greatest challenge question. Um, what gives you hope amid all of these challenges that we face related to climate change? Uh, uh, what, how do you want to communicate uh, that hope to our audience members and to the communities here on Delmarva? Well, I think it picks up from the, what Paula left off to, you know, with, with courage, it, it has to be, it has to be empowered to some sense by some level of optimism. That, 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 that this is not hopeless, that we're, there's some good things that can come out of all of this. We will have challenges, but there are some improvements, some benefits to our society, human society that we can realize. And, and, the, and the, someone who's worked in the, trying to get people to pay attention to climate change for a good part of my career, I, I'm, I'm just buoyed by what I see is actually a very dramatic transition in, in, in what matters to, to, to human society on national and international levels, that is, that is um, money. <laughs> and, and that you, you see these dramatic shifts. I was just reading today that Shell Oil is now putting in its performance uh, metrics for its senior management decarbonization and discounting, you know, there are traditional investments in either natural gas and so on. We see the revolution going on with respect to, um, um, you know, ele electrically, electric vehicles in, in ways that we wouldn't have thought possible um, just five years ago. Um, we, we're seeing governments, we're seeing industry companies, we're seeing cities making commitments to rapid decarbonization that, that, that just defies the thinking that we can go from the levels that we were to zero net emissions in only 30 years. You know, th with that comes surely some challenges, but some tremendous opportunities for bright people to come up with creative solutions to make, make a good living, to, to be profitable, to be successful in many, so many ways in their lives. Now we can't forget the people who, who you know, would, we, we would tend to be left a lot, left aside. But, but I think we also need to, in this message, we need to engender some sense of optimism uh, as we look toward the future. I mean, I'm I'm quite optimistic. Um, I, I view the last decade or decade and a half and looking at the environmentalist relationship with the ag community. You know, I have to draw on my little microcosm. And I look at when I got out of school in um, a long time ago, there was a lot of animosity. And I would say now that we have true collaborations, we really have people working together. We haven't solved the problem by any means, but we've really moved the finish line. We've extended it out. And I feel like as a farmer, I definitely have people pushing me forward as opposed to pushing me back. And I think that that, uh, to me, has been a very personal success um, in my career. And I feel that same thing within the climate. I mean, there's always going to be arguments and financials and all that stuff. But 
just based on my personal experience here on the shore, um, but some of the groups that are actually here as well, um, I just view that relationship entirely different. And I think it has been quite successful. Ray, I know that you've got to hop off in a couple of minutes to run to your next appointment. Um, I appreciate the time that you're giving us, but um, we've got one question that I do want to tailor to you. And I think that Laura might um, have some follow-up to this as well uh, with her ag experience. Um, how can we convince local farmers, farmers here on the Delmarva Peninsula, uh, to support Delmarva Oasis and do more within their regular routine uh, to, to support climate change action? Mm, I don't know. Um, I, a lot of it has to do with markets and marketing. Um, for me, a lot of it has really been, and I can only draw on my own personal experiences, was me being embraced by the community. And I say that, I don't say that lightly. Um, it sounds like, you know, one of those just answers that people give, but I know that going to, to testify with CBF very early in my career for cover crops when I didn't believe in them, uh, kind of learning what the people had and learning that the common communication between environmentalists and agriculture is emotion and passion. So you take two very passionate groups that are often doing things that are below their income potential, and I would say both are, um, they're very passionate about what they do and they care about what they do. And to me, that's the greatest opportunity for collaboration. It's also the greatest opportunity for opposition, right? Um, so for me, being embraced by the groups like the, the River Keepers and CBF um, really helped me socially change and psychologically change my mindset. Not completely. I mean, I, but I view myself as an environmentalist now, and I attribute that to the, the passion and the kindness that was expressed to me when I went into those meetings as a you know, moderately large scale farmer or whatever that's not typically accepted by the environmental community and assuming that I wouldn't be, you know, making that basic assumption that I never should have made. Um, but I think that assumption was reciprocated with me as well by the other side um, and learning that we had this shared passion, um, just passion for life, but also passion for the environment or land, our kids, the next generation and this, the sustainability approach just through different lenses, um, I think is the best thing. You know, I mean, it's, it's just, a, it's a very slow moving target, unfortunately. And for what it's worth, that's exactly how I would have answered that question coming from kind of a different perspective. But in general, I think people, well, specifically to agriculture, the way you, you help farmers um, take advantage of the potential that is in agriculture is to support them to do that. And I think that we have not supported farmers very well in this culture and particularly environmentalists haven't. So, you know, there's definite, and I think the, there has been an enormous change in the last decade around the climate solutions that have been discovered in agriculture, that have been discovered by the environmentalists, environmentalists that are possible within agriculture. And that's been a huge place for those two communities that have been kind of at each other's, uh, have been fighting and, and a lot of conflict a huge place to come together. And what you heard in Trey's answer is exactly what happens no matter what the conflict is and the people involved. You, get, you begin to say, hey, how can we work together? Oh, you've got something that, that might work for us. Let's start talking. Um, so beautiful answer and, and very, in my experience, it's just a very, it's human nature, what he's described. The other thing I want to, I'd like to say just to go back to the hope question for just a minute is that I think that Trey's answer actually gives us an excellent example of the kind of hope that we all need to hold in order to find solutions to climate change and these other wicked problems. And that is that it turns out I, I, I've been asked that hope question a lot in my work. And so I actually went and researched hope and what it is and what psychologists think it is and how you get it and how you keep it. And one of the amazing things I learned in looking into this was that first of all, there's all kinds of hope. There's at least seven kinds of hope. And there's one kind that is particularly useful 
in the, in managing, thinking about how we're going to solve these these challenges. And that kind of hope, and I, I, I'm not making this up, um, but I love it. It's called grounded hope. So certainly when I talk to agriculture audiences, that's pretty a wonderful coincidence. But what grounded hope is, is working in community for a desired future, a desired goal. And what Trey has described is exactly the kind of hope we need in order to overcome these challenges. There's lots of other hope. I'll tell you another, the, the other most common kind of hope, and I think it's the way that many people uh, understand hope or would define hope if you ask them. And that is just basically to, um, it's called wishful hope. It's hope that it's just all gonna work out or hope there's another kind of hope and it's kind of funny that the same kind of wishful hope also includes folks that just hope it's gonna work out. Those would be optimists and hope folks that know it will not work out. There's no way, pessimists. It turns out that's the same kind of hope because in both cases, you leave it to someone else to figure out. And that kind of hope leads to disengagement, disempowerment, despair and denial. Grounded hope, when you work towards a desired future in community, leads to, op to, to feeling hope for the future, to feeling positive that, 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 that you can achieve your goals. So grounded hope, wishful hope, y'all decide which one you'd like to, to use. But uh, I have found in my work that grounded hope is the way to go. Well, and thanks for that, Laura, because, you know, what you're talking about is really what inspires these moonshot goals or solutions, right, for, for the environment or for our planet. Um, it's that sense that, um, you know, if it's not just important conceptually, right, to, to I guess, with grounded hope, <laughs> um, work towards a goal to care for our planet. It's, it's also, uh, so it's not just important conceptually, right, it's important inspirationally. Because if you if you look at history, it's it's that sort of ambition, right? That sort of moonshot goal that drives humanity uh, to 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 new levels, right? To to new ways of of um, caring for uh, ourselves and our future. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think what you're saying, or what I'm hearing, and what you're saying is is there's sorts of two parts to achieving great things, and one is have a strong vision. And the other is physically, literally physically be involved in making that happen. And, and so it's that work in community, that actual work that is a really important piece of, of, of how we, uh, of, it defines us as humans. I mean, I don't know if this is quite true, but there are some that would argue that we are one of the unique aspects of our species is that we can trade, we can sit in a group and come up with a vision that we can all, we can describe and share, and then we can all work to it. It's one of the unique aspects of our species. Certainly, I don't wanna argue we're the only species that can do that. I don't know, probably not. But what I can say is that is an important element of who we are. And we have, we have lost that ability in our culture to do that, but we know how to do it. It's biologically wired in there. So we can start doing that again, if we choose. I'm, I'm, I'm struck with thinking as you spoke uh, that even coronaviruses have hope, right? They're, they're, they're planning for their future, <laughs> dealing with all the challenges there that we're throwing at them. So, I mean, you're right. It's, I, I was wondering um, and thinking about this, we talked about climate and agriculture in the Bay. Paula, the the the, 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 the challenge, the biodiversity loss challenge that we face, how, how are people, how, how, what's your views about how people can wrap their minds around it? Or are we getting to, to people to understand this in the same way that we are dealing with how climate might affect them or their grandchildren? I think so. I think absolutely. It's actually pretty exciting um, if you think about it. Um, and in some ways it'll be, it's easier because it's, it, 
well, it's the living world. It's what we relate to. It's, it's, it's part of our common humanity, part of the web of life of which we're a part. So it's in some ways, as we realize that biodiversity is the next big thing, right? Besides climate and the water crisis, um, <laughs> that it's almost easier for us to care about it too. Right. It's 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 it, we're infinitely connected to it in that way. And in some ways, that, that that's probably the the most exciting thing about the moment that we're in. Right. Is that is at least from where I'm sitting and what we're trying to do is that as we're seeing that open up, we're seeing even we're seeing investors talk to us about, well, what do we need to understand about this for this to be part of what we're doing with our investments and our companies? Our communities, our homes. It's. Um, I think it's actually a really exciting moment. And what's powerful about it as well is that we also now ha have more science, more insight, more technology that can help us really understand what we need to do. Um, what, it, as I spoke about at that uh, for first talk of this series of, you know, our ability to map the species of our planet at a really high resolution gives it so much more power to understand exactly where we need to go to achieve targets for biodiversity and as well as how to measure our success, right? And whether we're, we're uh, able to accomplish these goals and that gives people hope, right? Um, and so that I'm very encouraged um, by the, uh, what we're feeling now in this moment, this, this sort of brought, raised awakening to the importance of biodiversity and the importance of the environment to human health and um, the importance of collaboration of people working together to, to achieve goals like we, like we valiantly have through the coronavirus, right? Khalil, me been talking about, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say what gives me hope is looking at this this checkerboard of panelists here. And 20 years ago, Darius and I would not be invited to be on this, right? Not, not saying ESLC, but in general, an environmentally focused panel 20 years ago, Darius and I wouldn't be here. Or if, if one of us was, we would not see somebody else that looks like us. You know, 20 years ago, we wouldn't have a Trey Hill with his professional background being invited to be on this panel. 20 years ago, we wouldn't have the gender diversity that we have on this panel. 20 years ago, no offense, it would be nine squares of Jim and Don that would be the <laughs> panel talking to us. And as Paula was saying, it's all about the people. And the more, the more of the, the variety that we have of the people getting involved is telling us that we're expanding our message, expanding our base to get more people from different sectors and different backgrounds involved. And so seeing that diversity of profession, of gender, of race, et cetera, on this panel is something that gives me hope for the future as well. So, so don't talk to us about burnout because we, we, we have optimism and we need you. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be a whole team effort, right? Mm -hmm. um, we got a really good question earlier from Jeanette that I would like to address. Um, it's a pretty specific question. So Jeanette, I really appreciate this. I'm going to ask the question and then I'm going to expand on it a little bit. Uh, Jeanette asks, how are local governments in Delmarva, like, like Sussex County, Delaware, related to the Eastern Shore Land Conservancy? And how can we strengthen those relationships and interactions? And I love that so much because Eastern Shore Land Conservancy is an environmental nonprofit that serves six counties on Maryland's Eastern Shore. You know, we're, we're Cecil down through Dorchester. We cover a small part of a small, of a small region. Um, and and I, I think that, um, well, I, I'll go ahead and say it. Eastern Shore Land Conservancy does a really good job of sort of top-down partnerships. We have a lot of really, really good relationships with uh, with state organizations and some county organizations and other environmental nonprofits. But what we lack really is an effective sort of grassroots arm. And that's honestly part of the reason why we started to do this workshop series is because we wanted to engage residents of the Delmarva Peninsula a little bit more directly. And so to me, that means 
making a concerted effort to work across state lines with our partners in Delaware and Virginia, uh, whether it's other environmental nonprofits or whether it's working with other county governments and state governments or engaging with residents or whomever. Um, there's not really a good answer to this from my perspective, other than we've got to be willing and, and really ready and excited to talk to everybody about the stuff that we're passionate about and, and help people see themselves, everybody see themselves as part of the solution, whatever the solution is that we're discussing. Um, so that, that's my take on it from Eastern Shore Land Conservancy. Uh, I'm, I'm curious how everybody else sees that in terms of relationship building across the peninsula. Well, well, I, I, I just uh, would, Jim would like to say that having, you know, lived and worked on the Eastern Shore for a long time, I, um, you, you do have an opportunity to do that because most people live there, like living there, and they like living there because of its, its characteristics, it, that it isn't this sprawl everywhere. It's, it's towns and it's countryside and it's, and it's intermingled with woods. So everyone, even even the underprivileged, you know, who live in these communities, um, understand that. So I, I think there's a there's a there's an opportunity to engage uh, the broad spectrum of society with with the sense of place of what it is, and uh, not just you know landowners who want to preserve their their farms and countryside, but but the whole community who likes this landscape of of small towns and. And, and farm fields and, and woodlands and all intermingled. I can't speak directly to the Eastern shore. I haven't been there, haven't worked there and haven't been there in a long time. Um, but, I think, but I think Liz brought up the point I wanna make, which is that absolutely we need to get grassroots we need to get people involved and, and uh, inspire them in some way to begin to take part in creating solutions. But I think it's very important for us to remember that our communities are very degraded at this point. Liz spoke specifically to it. She said, we've been defunding government for 30 years. And so as we begin to look at how we build grassroots action, I think a really important piece of that is to understand the barriers or the limitations due to our past, uh, the, the past degradation that people have suffered and public institutions have suffered and to think about how we're going to uh, restore, repair some of that damage in that work that we're doing to try to build grassroots. So it's, it's a big challenge. Um, it's a big challenge for a little nonprofit. However, I believe that is the work before us at the moment. So we need to take very good care of all these people that we want to bring into this, this, uh, this work and make sure that we're figuring out how to do that in a way that is equitable and to keep that in front of what, what we do. And, and I think, you know, education is key the, to, to foster an intergenerational commitment to stewardship of the earth where we're, we're, we're nurturing each future generation through education to engage them in being part of a global community that perceives and celebrates the inherent value of nature and community and their ability to have a purpose-driven career that supports that and then becomes part of a culture of people that inevitably will, will work together like to, 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 to do what we must, right? To care for our home, inevitably. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's it, the ability to instill, instill that sense of purpose and maybe, and also that moral conviction is really, really important um, to uh, support next 
generation stewardship. I really appreciate that, Paula. Um, any other thoughts on this question before we move on to the next one? I, uh, I'm trying to keep an eye on the time. I, I wish that we had like 12 hours for this discussion. So we're trying to hit the highlights here. Um, ultimately, this workshop series has been all about um, inspiring or compelling uh, community action on, um, on environmental issues and on climate change. Uh, so I want to ask, um, pick one way that Delmarva residents can make a difference or contribute to climate resilience. What did you pick and why? I guess I'll go first because I have a very quick answer. Stop wasting food. And why? Because I think when I'm asked to give advice for individuals and what they can do around climate. That seems to me to be the absolutely easiest win-win kind of action. Um, it's win in two, in terms of climate, it's win in two ways. One, uh, you're, you're not wasting your money on, by buying food that you never eat. And number two, uh, every pound of food that is not wasted reverberates back through the food system to save seven times the energy input for thinking about it just in terms of climate change. So just that's a really simple thing. Just stop, please, wasting food. It's a great way to start. Well, I don't, I don't want to get uh, too political, but, but uh, just thinking about uh, Liz, his presentation about coastal Louisiana and looking at the commonalities that we talked about, low line, you know, sea level rise, all those uh, migration and movement, all those things. The other thing these two regions have in common is that their, represented, uh, their representatives are effectively climate deniers. Steve Scalise represents the most endangered district in the United States. Steve Scalise of Louisiana. It's going, largely going away in this century or, or early next century. Andy Harris represents Delmarva. Now, I, I don't, I, you know, so, so we have to get people to think that that matters to them, that, 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 that we want leaders who basically are being honest and based on evidence and reality in dealing with our future and not just beholding to the special interests that garner their support for these issues. I mean, I, I, I know it runs the risk of getting a little political, but there's a connection about what people think in our democracy and what their elected officials, we allow their elected officials to do. So somehow we, we need to get people understanding, even though they might have for, for, for good, honest reasons, conservative values, whether they're social or economic values, that this is not a political issue. This is reality and that we need political leaders to find solutions, whether they be conservative market-based solutions or other kinds of solutions that deal with the reality. And until we find that changing, they will continue to do those things. <laughs> So I, I hate to be political again, but I mean, there's a connection between society and, and, and politics. And it, it, it's good, it's democracy, but the democracy has to insist that we have leaders that are looking for pathways to our future. Paula or Khalil, do you have tips that you would like to share? Um, it's, 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 I work every day to try to convene people under an umbrella moonshot solution. Um, one of the things that I think is really important is 
is also to under is also to create the opportunity for individuals everywhere to participate. And and I, I see what you're saying, Don. There's this barrier of like that that. But at the same time, I think if we honor the unique experience or expertise of every individual in the room, um, then that empowers them to be able to lean forward in big or small ways, in, in whatever way they know or understand in their lives, and that that's enough. And, and what empowers people in that moment, I think, is that, is that it's enough because they're all working towards the same thing, right? That, that it gives them courage then to, to be able to realize that what they're doing makes a difference. And I, I think that inspires a lot of us to do great things. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not an expert on the Delmarva area. I, I live just outside Washington, D.C. in the D.C. urban suburbs. I couldn't have said it any more eloquently than Don did. I think that there are these tips on you know, your, your consumption practices, your travel practices, but the biggest legacy you can have is how you choose your decision makers moving forward and the role you play in that. And things, environmental issues, things like climate change, this isn't like, okay, we're in a race to get to the moon first. This isn't something like that. This is time is of the essence. This is what's the legacy you're leaving for your kids and your grandkids and the decision makers who are or making policies around that when in the next two to three decades, there's gonna be huge impacts on where we live, how we live, all those different things. How you cast your vote has a profound impact on what the future looks like. I really appreciate that. Those are all great responses. Um, this is gonna be our final question tonight. Um, before I pose the question, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to remind everybody that uh, ESLC, really thanks to Darius, uh, ESLC um, keeps a very, very active social media presence. Uh, so if you're watching this as a recorded webinar later on, Excuse me. Or if you uh, if you think of questions that didn't come to you this evening, um, please shoot them to us via Facebook or Twitter or uh, leave a comment on our YouTube videos, uh, because we really want to make sure that uh, folks are getting the information that they want and that they need, and that we stay engaged with the subject matter experts like the folks that you see here with us this evening. Um, so. With that, I will pose the final question for the evening, which is uh, we've covered a lot of ground tonight and throughout the entire workshop series. Uh, what are your closing thoughts or recommendations? Uh, what are the last things that you wanna leave us with? I realize I should have given people a heads up that like we're going to close on a well, just, just I mean this this is not about the universe of issues. This is where we should focus on our sponsors, the the, the host, the Eastern Shore Land Conservancy, and and you, you know the work you're doing is so incredibly important uh, for all the things we're talking about. Uh, it, it's important for allowing Ty and his next generations to continue to produce food and to, to make a living, a good living doing that. Uh, it, it's important for Paula in the biodiversity in this, this very important part of the eastern east coast of the United States. It, it's important for water quality. It's important for food health. It's all of those things. So, so just to think of the connection among these. When Paula was talking about how get people inspired, you know, almost from a spiritual way about, about the, 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 the rich diversity we have in life. And we were talking about climate and what it means to people and having their lives disrupted. All of those things are connected. They're not in separate issues. They all come together in, in the good work that you folks are doing in trying to manage a, you know, a, a, a landscape that people will enjoy their lives in, can make a living in, and, and, can, and can sustain biodiversity, can contribute to climate solutions and allow us a pathway to the future.
I guess I'll jump in and just say that, um, say two things. One, we know how to do this. We know how to solve these problems. And that, that wisdom, that knowledge comes from a very long uh, history of living well on this planet. We know the, the, um, <clears throat> the scientists, the, the neurologists and folks that study how our brains work, we know that we are biologically wired and we have two sides that our nature is biologically wired. We have two sides to our nature. We have what you can think of as a dark side and a light side. The dark side is fueled by capitalism. It's fueled by our modern culture. We can call it that. That is greedy, is afraid that we don't have enough and is selfish and takes care of our own tribe. We have another side that's the light side of our nature. And that side is generous, generous pulls together in, in when we are in trouble, when there's some kind of catastrophe, starts to care for our neighbors, care for our community, is generous and knows that we have enough. So what I wanna say, what I wanna leave you with is remember that we have these two sides to our nature and let's work together to bring out the best of, of our nature. Um, well, I, I, I'll also thank you for that. <laughs> um, and, and also thank you to Don for helping me make the pitch for biodiversity. I guess if I had to leave people in the room, uh, with anything, which is which is to remember why we care, you know, uh, why if a species goes extinct, why it matters, um, and uh, it it matters because somewhere in the core of our humanity, we recognize these creatures. We're touched by their story. We can feel we feel extraordinary compassion for them, but it also matters when uh, the species of our planet for us to remember the species of our planet don't don't exist in isolation. Um, if we lose species, we also lose the ecosystems and the intricate web of life that sustains nature and sustains us as part of nature. Um, and so uh, I guess that's what I would leave people with is to remember we're part of a web of life. Um, and through our compassion, we must also remember to care for the care for the species which don't have that voice um, uh, in the room. And thank you to Eastern Shore Land Conservancy for, well, doing everything you do to care for the species of your place. <laughs> Salute you. <laughs> I'll add that, you know, the old adage, the, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago and the second best time is right now. And you know, we can take actions now and that you cannot find any type of environmental degradation or challenge that is not also paired with or built upon the back of the exploitation and the inequity that has been the foundation of our national and more increasingly global structure. And so to keep in mind that those two things are intertwined and linked and the impact and um, the inequities that have been rested upon many people for decades are also connected and should be a part of the comprehensive strategy of how we try to solve these global environmental challenges. That's beautifully said. Thank you all so very much. Um, Paula, Laura, Khalil, Don, we absolutely could not do this without you. Um, I personally have had so much fun with this workshop series. Uh, I hope that you have as well. Um, we, we've just, you know, organizationally, we've continued to be really, really excited by uh, the turnout that we've gotten for these events and the engagement that we've gotten um, during the events as well as afterwards. Um, we're really, really pleased with how this has all come together. And, you know, we, we, we find people who have exciting things to discuss and uh, inspirational stories to tell and, uh, 
this is what it's all about. So thank you so much for, um, for our speakers, uh, for giving us your time and your energy and your expertise. Uh, thank you to everybody in the audience for participating, um, for learning and for sharing your experience. And I hope that everybody will walk away uh, a little bit more uh, informed about how to take action and inspired to go out and make a little bit of a change however you possibly can. Uh, I wanna thank the Roush Foundation one more time uh, for their generous support of these events. Um, thank you to everybody at Eastern Shoreline Conservancy has contributed to this, uh, particularly the, the project team. Um, lots and lots of hands uh, came together to make this all possible. Uh, I've been asked to uh, summarize the key takeaways from uh, the entire workshop series. And again, that could take 12 hours as well. But the, the key things that I honed in on uh, tonight that I wanted to just reflect for everybody, um, the things I heard are stop wasting food, advocate politically for good solutions and pick good leaders. Involve people from all perspectives in our solutions determining processes. And finally, stressing the importance of biodiversity and healthy ecosystems, because it's all one very closely and delicately interconnected web. Thank you all very, very much. Follow uh, Eastern Shoreline Conservancy on social media or sign up for our email lists. We're gonna have a lot more really good events coming up soon uh, in the spring and throughout the summer. Uh, we hope to see you guys again soon, uh, in person or virtually or however it's safe to do so. Everybody be well and thank you again so much for making this such a success. Have a good night.